My name is Al Lucas uh, with the faculty, and uh, I want to welcome all of you to the Milvane Lecture for 2015. Uh, the Milvane Lecture is uh, a partnership between uh, the Faculty of Law and uh, the Calgary Bar Association. And uh, the, uh, the Milvane Lecture and the Milvane Chair uh, goes back over 30 years with the uh, law school and uh, if, you, uh, if you take a look on the website you will see that uh, the Milvain chair has been held by a succession of uh, Canada's leading advocates for uh, over three decades. So this is an important part of the uh, faculty's program. But in addition I want to acknowledge the uh, partnership with the uh, Calgary Bar Association. That is what has uh, uh, made the uh, program uh, possible and uh, the faculty very much appreciates that partnership and the support uh, for this program from the uh, Calgary Bar Association. You hear, you'll hear from Craig Steele from the CBA a little bit later uh, in uh, the program today. So my job right now is to go straight to the introduction of our uh, Milvane Chair in Advocacy, David Tavender QC. The lecture is, is only part of what David uh, has been doing this week. Uh, the Milvane Chair in Advocacy presents the Milvane Lecture, but also participates as an instructor in the uh, trial advocacy course, DR3, to uh, the uh, third year group, right? And some of you will have encountered David in your, uh, in your small group. So today is the lecture. Uh, David Tavender is uh, partner emeritus with uh, Denton's Canada. David is uh, senior litigation counsel. He has tremendous experience in uh, civil commercial litigation as well as in uh, dispute resolution. And he's been involved in uh, major trials and uh, appeals uh, for a very long time. And uh, his, his involvement has been with uh, the Alberta Superior Courts as well as uh, the federal superior courts, including the uh, Supreme Court of Canada, and in, in addition, uh, uh, arbitral tribunals and the, uh, uh, and the like. So he's involved not only in, in formal uh, litigation, but uh, uh, in uh, dispute resolution processes uh, as, as well. So I have a list of uh, major cases and uh, matters that David has, uh, has handled over, over the years. And I can tell you that those go on for a number of uh, pages. But what I want to add in this introduction uh, is that David has been very firmly committed to uh, pro bono uh, activities. And uh, that includes uh, both within the legal profession uh, and uh, in the community, and his work in the community includes uh, uh, on the uh, art side with uh, uh, the Banff Center and uh, uh, the Glenbow uh, Foundation. So he's not only been active in the courts as a uh, uh, trial lawyer and uh, an appellate advocate, but very much uh, in the uh, community as well. So with that very brief introduction, um, David today is going to be focus on, focusing on uh, appellate advocacy. So uh, uh, an advocate's perspective uh, um, on uh, trial advocacy. So please uh, join me in welcoming David Tavender, QC.
Thank you, Alistair. I will uh, repeat my thanks a few mo moments later for the reason that I'm here. <clears throat> I'll start off by simply saying that for the purposes of my lecture, with all of these wonderful third-year students benefiting from this uh, course on trial advocacy, I thought it might be of some benefit to those students to gain some perspectives on appellate advocacy. After all, the trial is not the conclusion of the court process. Appeals are uh, frequent and indeed sometimes inevitable. Obviously, you as legal practitioners will need to master the arts and skills of appellate advocacy as well as learning as effectively as you are this week about trial advocacy. Now, I'm not so bold to suggest that in the space of a few minutes or half an hour, I can tell you all you need to know about appellate advocacy. What I propose to do is to share with you the perspectives that I have focused on as a result of my uh, rather considerable number of years of litigation practice. Now, before I get into the appellate advocacy comments, let me say how deeply grateful I am to have been selected by the Law School and the Calgary Bar Association as the 2015 Chair of Trial Advocacy. Um, the mention of Chief Justice Milvane brings back to me many appearances that I had before him as one of our very great judges. And I have the highest regard for the memory of Chief Justice Milvane. I'm also enormously impressed with the list of uh, prior chairs who uh, have given lectures in the past years. Uh, most of whom exceed my qualifications. I mean, you have to wait 30 years to get to me. You've gone through some really good advocates to get here. I want to point out that in 1979, the very first Milvane Chair of Trial Advocacy was J.J. Robinette, QC. Now, with no disrespect to me or the other 29 years of Milvane chairs, um, J.J. Robinette stands out in Canadian history. Uh, many commentators have referred to him as the finest litigator of the 20th century in Canada. I had the privilege of working with J.J. Um, when he was in his 80s. And that's no small feat. When you're my age, it's only a few years away. For many of you, you'll be automatically retired and comfortable at age 55. But J.J. in his 80s was an active practicing lawyer. And on one particular file, we had a mutual client. We met in the fishbowl room of the McCarthy office in Toronto overlooking Lake Ontario. And uh, JJ and I had worked to together for several days as I watched JJ end up with almost a handwritten legal opinion. It did get typed, but it was handwritten till the very end. And it was a very positive opinion. The mutual client in the fishbowl conference room pressed J.J. to go beyond this positive written opinion and encouraged him to present in percentage terms J.J.'s estimate of our chances of success in the Supreme Court of Canada where we were headed.
J.J. literally ducked and twisted for as long as he could, but he finally caved in to the client's pressure. With a deep, audible sigh, he rasped out, very good. <laughs> Long pause. 50-50, I should think. <laughs> so let me make that my first observation on appellate advocacy, and I guess it applies to all advocacy. Predictions of outcome are fraught with uncertainty. If none other than the great J.J. Robinette could not be pressured beyond a 50-50 estimate, few, if any of us, even with the rosiest of glasses, should I suggest be more optimistic in our opinions. Now what I intend to cover for the rest of the, this lecture are four points. Preparation, the factum, oral argument, and teamwork. So that's one, two, three, four, and I don't know how many computers are working out there, but it's easier to get those down that way <clears throat> than in writing. Let me start with preparation. Preparation from the start to finish is both extensive and vital. There can in some cases be a vast amount of material including facts, expert reports, and legal authorities that appellate counsel must thoroughly review and understand. Starting with a mastery of that material, counsel's preparation must then proceed to identify and articulate the essential issues and the supporting legal and factual arguments that are to be advanced in support of those core elements of the appeal. To effectively articulate those core elements of the appeal is a major goal of preparation. It is usually requiring extensive and creative legal research and a lot of writing, and let me emphasize rewriting. And what ends up from all of that will be the factum. But preparation does not end when you have completed your factum. Preparation for oral argument is essential. This phase of your factum, and uh, some of you this morning may have heard echoes of what I'm now about to say. This phase of your preparation should include speaking notes to assist you in presenting your oral argument before the court and in anticipating the questions that will be put to you by the court. I worked for a number of years with the great W.A. McGilvery, QC, later Chief Justice of Alberta. He had a system which involved the preparation of a number of handwritten notes on sheets of paper with a wide range of separate subject headings. Now, I talked in our group this morning about his trial preparation. I'm now talking about uh, an adaptation of that for appellate adv advocacy. <coughs> Excuse me. This is the most flu-ridden area of Canada, as I understand it. <laughs> Bill McGilvery's separate sheets of paper with a, their separate headings would have identified the key points he thought were important, and he would have extensive colored highlighting and cross-references. These on a simple almost flow chart so that he could go from the point to the cross-reference 
to get the authority which he would also have highlighted. Cross-references are very important. In these notes, he tried to anticipate every point he intended to make an oral argument and every question he anticipated the court might ask of him. He was extremely effective in using these notes for quick reference. And the emphasis there is on quick. Working closely with your support team and co-counsel can add highly beneficial results throughout the entire preparation process. Third party consultations should be considered. Justice Iacobucci, who has only recently retired as one of the great judges of the Supreme Court of Canada, was responsible for setting up review panels of experienced lawyers across the country who would be available on a voluntary basis to audit for counsel their arguments shortly before their Supreme Court of Canada hearings. Third-party reviews of any sort can be highly beneficial to help force to force appellate counsel to practice and practice more their oral submissions carefully and to get advice on how to improve their submissions. A totally different but important aspect of preparation is researching and studying the attitudes, predilections, and prior decisions of the expected members of the, your Court of Appeal. So let me move now to my second topic, the factum. The factum, nowadays in particular, is absolutely crucial. In many and probably most cases, the factum can <coughs> exceed substantially the importance of oral submissions. <coughs> let me quote from the late Justice John Sapinka of the Supreme Court of Canada. He said this about the factum, and I'm now quoting. I have uh, authorities that I cited in this. This is Sapinka and Gilowitz. It's called The Conduct of an Appeal. It's a 2012 edition. And towards the end, there's a Sapinka section. I also worked with John Sapinka and indeed played golf with him. And uh, what a wonderful man he was, and what a tremendous judge and lawyer as well as a football player in his university days. Quote, the importance of the factum is readily apparent when one considers that it is the central document at all stages of the appeal. One, before the argument, it is the principal source of the judge's information about the case. Two, during the argument, it is the blueprint, and I want you to remember that phrase, blueprint, it is the blueprint for counsel's argument. Three, after the argument, it is used to remind the judges of the oral argument and as a vital supplement to oral argument. But perhaps its greatest impact is that it provides the court with its first impression of the case and of counsel. That's the end of the quote. Let me say this about the fact, and this is, you'll find it in all the literature, and I believe these to be absolutely essential. One, it should be clear. Two, it should be well written. Three, it should be concise. Four, it should address compellingly both favorable and unfavorable key points. Former Alberta Appellate Justice Joseph Stratton stated, and I'm quoting, my advice to the author of a factum in a nutshell is to be concise, but in doing so, not to sacrifice clarity, as the latter is of overriding importance. There's an appellate counsel in Ottawa called Eugene Meehan. He practices uh, substantially in the Supreme Court of Canada and giving advice to counsel 
to assist them in their appeals and appearances in the Supreme Court of Canada. He said, and I'm now quoting, most lawyers write sentences that are too long. Now, I just ask you to pause with that one and think of Conrad Black and go from there. <coughs> I've read sentences that are three quarters of the page long, written by Conrad Black, which isn't to say the substance isn't there, but it's very hard for anyone to read on and on and on. Short sentences. Eugene Meehan also said that the key is, and these are critical words, clarity, brevity, and simplicity. Justice Sapinka pleaded for simple and direct language and sentence structure and factors. To achieve these goals takes thorough, careful preparation and plenty of rewriting. Turning to the content of your factum, you need to focus on what is compelling and essential. And you're going to hear me repeat in various ways what I'm now about to say. You should eliminate weak arguments and non-essential facts. You should be guided by the advice, and this is again from John Sapinka. In the vast majority of cases, there are a maximum of three issues that have any prospect of success. In selecting those key issues and facts and law you choose to cite, struggle to put yourself in the mindset of the reviewing court. If an appellate justice would want you to see in a factum, what would it want to see and what would it likely ignore? Ask yourself that question. Try and put yourself that objectively above your case. I'm going to repeat this several times, but your factum should not be one-sided. Address the best arguments of the opposing side head-on and demonstrate to the best of your ability why those opposing arguments should be rejected. As Justice Sapinka, and I'm quoting him frequently, said, quote, meet your difficulties early and face up to them boldly. That's the end of the quote. But again, I'm going to say avoid exaggeration and overstatement. Strive throughout to be scrupulously fair and candid. The factum should begin with an introduction or overview. Our Alberta rules of court don't talk about that. My practice is to include a brief introduction which sets out the key points that are an issue in the appeal. The Supreme Court of Canada practice calls for what is called an overview. And this goes beyond identifying simply the key points. Eugene Meehan recommends that the overview be, uh, follows the, what he calls the first page rule, but then adds crucially that says it all. He recommends a one paragraph overview statement that tells the reader what the case is about, who did what to whom, what the issues are, and outlines your position on those issues. Now that's a pretty big challenge for me to get into one paragraph at the start of a fact. Uh, in a recent case that I argued in the Supreme Court of Canada, my brief one page overview turned out to be seven paragraphs and three pages in length. Now my excuse for that case is that the court allowed us a factum limit of 60 pages rather than the normal 40 page limit. The Alberta rules practice is to limit you to 30 pages of a factum in the Court of Appeal of Alberta. These page limits really reinforce dramatically the importance of having that opening overview, opening statements set out clearly and compellingly in your factum. You can use the rest of your factum to give body to the need to be clear and compelling. I want to talk about facts. Do not gloss over facts in your factum. Material facts are crucial. They provide the context which governs how the case, how the law should be applied. 
If you seek to challenge a fact finding of a lower court, you must strive to meet the very high test of establishing a palpable and overriding error. Provide, where possible, a short, compelling quote from important evidence. If that is not possible, provide an accurate summary of that evidence with footnotes that will take the court quickly and efficiently to highlighted supporting evidence set out in your appeal book and what we now call in Alberta extracts of key evidence. Do not set out lengthy quotes in the factum. And again, in setting out your facts, avoid exaggeration, overstatements, and misquotes. Make concessions where concessions are called for. Strive throughout your submissions to be fair and reasonable, not, not just in reference to your facts, but throughout your factum and in your argument a justified reputation for fairness and reasonableness at the end of an appeal is a goal we all should strive for, and it may have very <coughs> beneficial results. Turning from the facts to the submissions of law and supporting authorities, let me focus once again on <coughs> clarity, brevity, and simplicity. Let the court know upfront what your key issues are and why they should be resolved in your favor. Set out what the principles of law are that dictate the results you seek. Set out why these principles apply to the facts of your case. Support your submissions with careful, succinct references to authorities that can include case law, textbooks, and guess what? academic references. A short quote from a binding or persuasive authority that is directly on point should be set out in your factum. Additional supporting authorities may be footnoted with clear and precise references to highlighted quotes set out in your tab book of authorities. It is highly desirable, but not always possible, to limit the number of authorities you refer to. If you do not have a binding authority from a superior court on your key issues, you may be required to identify a guiding principle that by logic and common sense ought to govern the outcome of your case. This guiding principle may be set out or inferred in lower court non-binding decisions or textbooks or academic articles. Here your challenge is to use your authorities in a way that convincingly persuades the court that your guiding principles should be adopted and applied in your favor. Do not ignore conflicting contrary principles and authorities. As Sapinka urged, face up to your difficulties boldly. Early and careful preparation should prepare you to be able to answer effectively contrary arguments and authorities. If you do not have a convincing response, perhaps you made a mistake in participating in that particular appeal. Be sure to set out clearly in your factum your conclusions and the relief you seek, including directions from the court on costs. The factum may not now reflect the totality of the written submissions you file in court. The Supreme Court of Canada rules have recently incorporated the requirement of filing what is called a condensed book. This book is to be filed shortly before the commencement of oral argument. It is to contain two, just two pages of a summary in point form of each argument you intend to advance. Attached to that two-page summary is to be a compendium of all of the extracts of the evidence and authorities that support each of those points, carefully condensed to what's critical and highlighted. 
In my last Supreme Court of Canada case, my condensed book didn't look very condensed. And I did apologize to the court. But it was still two pages of argument. But it was all the vast amount of material, even condensed and reduced, boiled down to the highlighted relevant questions. It was still a substantial document. So that <coughs> provides the court in a written form with what you think are, your arguments are a few days before you are actually arguing with attached to it the support and reference and the authorities referenced and highlighted in an efficient and effective way. This condensed book is intended to reduce or avoid the necessity of counsel referring to and quoting from an endless stream of supporting evidence and authorities during oral argument. In addition, as you get closer to the hearing date, your own perspectives may be modified from what you set out in your factum. The factum of other factums of other parties may influence what you want to say. There may be recent cases that have been published that need to be incorporated into your argument. And your own thinking may have become refined. Putting something in writing in this form just before the court argument may be a better blueprint, remember that word from Sapinka, of your argument than what you had set out several months ago or maybe many months ago in your factum. In my limited experience, the condensed book <coughs> has proved to be extremely effective. It is so effective, in fact, that I obtained the permission of our Alberta Court of Appeal to use on an appeal a somewhat similar uh, variation of this condensed book. Uh, I warn you that if you try something like that, be sure to talk to all counsel, advise them of your intentions, and seek to get their consent to what you're seeking to do, or alternatively give them the chance to uh, debate whether you should be able to file this document with the court when you're in the court. Now let me turn to my third point, oral argument. Time limits for oral argument are now highly shortened. The Alberta Court of Appeal generally allows 45 minutes only per party. The Supreme Court of Canada generally allows only one hour for all parties representing one side of the case. These time limits underline the high importance of your factum and your other written materials, the condensed book, and so on. Oral argument, nevertheless, can be extremely effective in some cases. Mind you, there will be cases where the court will tell you very early that you're going to be tossed out <coughs> without much discussion. And that, I regret to say, is not an infrequent occurrence. For the rest of the cases, however, effective oral argument can contribute to a favorable outcome, and it can influence the court beyond what is set out in factums. <coughs> for that reason, careful preparation for oral argument is essential. In oral argument, I favor brief introductory remarks. I generally will introduce my co-counsel, if there are strangers in the courtroom on the other side, I'll, if I'm the appellant, I'll make sure they get properly introduced. Um, after that, I will give a brief outline of what I intend to cover in my oral submissions. And I will include a reference in that introduction to any arguments that are going to be uh, put forward by co-counsel. So that's an introduction. I'll be sure to point out any concessions that I intend to make or any arguments that I intend to abandon. But very quickly, with that little brief introduction, I want to get to the point where I outline the heart of my case. The heart of the case should be boiled down to the key points that clearly and convincingly demonstrate why your side should prevail, and why the other side's best arguments should be rejected. Throughout your argument, 
Avoid non-essential matters. You're getting tired of repetition by now. Avoid mindless repetition of what is in the filed written materials. Avoid reading head down your written notes and factum. Avoid using, put it this way, use your speaking notes as ready references where a glance at what you have in front of you is all you need to recall the substance of what you intend to say. And avoid over rapid, over hasty speaking habits. Master and know in advance what you intend to say so that you can focus your eyes on the judges and try to read their reactions as accurately as you can. A quizzical expression from a judge may deserve another sentence to try and clarify your submission. But be warned, prepared submissions will frequently be interrupted by pointed questions emanating from the bench. This can present the most feared and challenging aspect of oral, of, a, of appellate advocacy. Be clear, judges' questions often contain the seeds of real concerns. If not answered effectively, those seeds may grow into cantankerous weeds that may dominate the court's subsequent decision. Listen carefully to each question that is put to you. Ask politely for clarification if necessary. Do not duck or defer your answer. Struggle to understand the implications of the question. Pray that your careful preparation has led you to anticipate the substance of the question and that you have an easily accessible note or a brilliant memory, setting out a clear and convincing response to the question. Try your best in your response to dispel any negative implication to the merits of your case. Try to turn the question into another reason why your side should prevail or why the subject matter of the question can be properly set aside as not being relevant. Some questions from the court may be potentially beneficial to your argument. A particular question may be intended to clarify an ambiguity, open up the door for arguments favorable to your case, or provide ammunition to be used against the other side, or let me add, the views of another judge. Rely on your thorough and careful preparation. Be clear, convincing, courteous, and respectful in your, in your responses. Avoid to the best of your ability being blindsided without an effective answer to a critical question. Now let me add to what I had in my prepared remarks a comment or two about the world of technology change. The book of authorities that I referred to is now filed in two formats, a traditional hard copy and an electronic copy. And uh, my experience these days is that virtually every judge has a computer screen sitting in front of him or her and they are very skilled in referring to authorities electronically. I won't say that applies to all of them. In the Supreme Court of Canada, there are now computer screens for the judges and for all counsel. And when you uh, approach the uh, dais for counsel, well, it's reserved for those who are making their oral submissions. There's a computer screen there with lots of buttons and bells and whistles as well as a very large table that happens to house th uh, those who are traditionalists uh, quantities of uh, hard copy material. That computer technology that we now have may someday replace most of the paper that is involved in appellate advocacy. 
Uh, it certainly may replace what J.J. Robinette and Bill McGilvery employed so effectively using written paper notes. In my experience, the time has not yet come where that technology is going to replace the valued use of paper and written transcripts and uh, materials of a traditional nature, at least for those of us who are much older than my uh, younger grandchildren, who are now wizards, it seems, with so much of the uh, computer technology. Um, I, uh, in my last appearance in the Supreme Court of Canada, with I think 19 separate parties represented in that huge courtroom, I did not see one counsel employing the computer screen directly or indirectly in the course of argument or any time I looked around the room when they were sitting listening to other arguments and they, as the case progressed. Everyone was using the traditional paper copy reference notes and hard copy uh, support material for their factums, for the written authorities, for the evidence references that they made. Now this may well change. And I read an article from a lawyer in Chicago who talked about having developed a very high skilled technology uh, electronic device uh, and, and software that uh, could be used effectively for courtroom purposes. Um, and I suspect that you in this law school are much closer than uh, those of us who are well older than you to use these new techniques. Uh, I caution you that uh, new technology always has its issues and concerns and uh, use it only with great care with the object that you can be as effective or more effective than the J.J. Robinettes and the Bill McGilvery's of the elder, older generations. I want to talk a bit about visual aids, charts, and PowerPoint type presentations in the context of appellate advocacy. Um, as a, an arbitrator, I see quite a bit of this, and often I find it disconcerting. Uh, often I am looking at the ear of a witness instead of the face of a witness, while the witness is looking at a PowerPoint screen and reading off literally canned evidence that no doubt some lawyer had some role in assisting the expert preparing. Uh, I haven't seen, in my experience, anyone in the Court of Appeal as an advocate using PowerPoint to assist argument. What I have done is used um, occasionally charts, diagrams, documents that I have appended as appendices to my factum, which are intended to be explanatory of the evidence that uh, is before the court. And once or twice, that has worked with some success. But be very careful about doing it. And again, be careful that you don't cross over any uh, rules of court or objections of <coughs> other parties. Uh, I certainly have not gone beyond that. And I haven't seen uh, counsel, in my experience, uh, trying to put something on a chart and put down points one through five. All of that should be in your factum and in your condensed book. And you should be able to then talk freely about it. So let me move now to my fourth point, teamwork. And this will be quite brief. Teamwork involves working closely and cooperatively with members of your firm and with co-counsel who are acting for your client or for other parties who share a common interest with your client. <laughs> Reviewing and mastering hundreds and sometimes thousands of factual and expert evidence pages is a huge task where a team can be invaluable to assist you. 
Legal research can be even more challenging and time-consuming where the help of others may be essential. Working to identify and articulate essential issues of the legal and factual submissions that are to form the core elements of the appeal can benefit tremendously from the combined work of a fully dedicated team of lawyers. Drafting and redrafting the factum, preparing and reorganizing your oral argument, and sometimes sharing oral, oral argument, all can benefit from a dedicated team. <coughs> I can't think of many cases over my entire career where I prepared alone uh, an appeal. And uh, when that happened, it was probably a very simple, straightforward one. Let me conclude in the context of teamwork with the importance of consultation and cooperation with co-counsel, including counsel for other parties who share common interests with your client. Keep those doors of communication open so that the collective quality of your work is enhanced and conflicting submissions and needless repetition are avoided. Will you let me end by quoting from a non-lawyer, none other than the recently depart departed, greatly admired hockey star Jean Beliveau. In his 1994 autobiography, he wrote, and I quote, an autobiography must by definition be written in the first person, but the first person was never what my career was about, on or off the ice. Everything I achieved through my career and all the rewards that followed came as the result of team effort. If they say anything about me when I'm gone, let them say that I was a team man. To me, there is no higher compliment. That's the end of the quote. I encourage all of you to apply that advice in the conduct of your appellate advocacy and indeed should I say throughout your legal careers and perhaps throughout your life. Thank you very much. Jerry's question for all of you, if I've got it right, is how do you balance the outcome in your given case with, I'm going to say, the risk of creating some adverse consequence uh, more broadly outside of your case? Does that capture it, Jerry? Yeah. Uh, I have mentioned in my comments the importance of uh, legal principles being uh, inherent in your case and uh, the need to have logic and common sense working for you. And when you look for guiding principles, uh, such as the rule of law, there ought not to be adverse consequences flowing from the application of such a principle. So then when you turn to the application of those principles to the specific outcome of your case, I think you need to be very, very conscious of and concerned about any negative, broader implications that such a decision would have on 
general legal principles or matters of common sense and logic and public interest. Uh, so I believe those are matters that you need to consider, address in your preparation, and do your very best to diminish or eliminate. If you're caught in a case where you think you've got a perfect outcome because the Supreme Court of Canada said something once, but the outcome would conflict with, let's say, the rule of law in a dramatic way, I think you've got some problems. And, but Jerry, maybe you'd like to throw in any comments you might have in response to what I've just said. No, no, I think, you, I think you've answered it. It's always been of interest to me that and, and there are, and, and sometimes the result that you're seeking in a case may, may advantage your client in those particular instances, but you have other clients who perhaps operate in the same industry who, if you win on this appeal, and the law and the problem changes as a result of that, you may disadvantage clients for whom you also act uh, who operate in the same industry. For any of you who have been reading Aboriginal law cases of the Supreme Court of Canada in the last five years, you'll appreciate that decision after decision has sometimes dissenting decisions, but they're all wrestling with fundamentally Jerry's issue. What? will be the outcome for Aboriginals in this country if we make the following findings. And uh, often they're looking at, well, what will be the effect on the country and our government if we permit certain things to happen because, for example, an individual Aboriginal ban raises an important personal argument. And those are constantly I think, in front of the Supreme Court of Canada, and I think your question is a great one, but I think uh, there is no way that we can avoid the requirement of trying to sculpt the result of our decision into a reasonable view of the legal principles that ought to apply to society. I could add a comment along those lines, Cliff Shaw. Uh, historically, or at least in the 30 some years from law school to me onward, when you're dealing with, this is a little different from what Jerry said, but the governing rule is law, and then public policy, which we used to hear was an unruly horse at Dalhousie Law School, if you have a situation where to do the right thing is going to be somewhat of a unique one off occasion, you do it and in briefing or studying the case or rationalizing it, you said, policy decision. If you're in the stream of more strict, established legal rules, you follow that. But the court's room equity or policy considerations is often in a narrow circumstance where you just have to do the right thing, you know, for society or individuals under hardship. Well, that's only a part of what was asked in the question, but I thought I'd make that comment. So that everybody here, Cliff, was making the important point that policy and equity really emerged, I think, in response to Jerry's question, to deal with difficult cases and to find an exception. But generally speaking, those equity and policy principles had or led to new policies, new principles that had then to be reconciled with the other ones that otherwise seem to be in conflict. Equity follows law. Yeah, that's it. Stop. <coughs> David, much of what you talked about assumed that the, uh, the court would do its part too, would have read the materials, prepared, and so on. Um, what do you do when you encounter uh, an ill-prepared judge or, or a rude judge. Uh, what, what kinds of things do you do as a, to be an effective appellate advocate in those circumstances? So the question is clear. It's in the mic, and it's from the dean. <laughs> um, I seldom encounter ill-prepared judges. In the last... Uh, 20 years, I can't think quickly of an instance of that. And uh, indeed, I have been 
tremendously impressed with the obvious detailed preparation that our judges undertake. And I have, well, in one Supreme Court of Canada, I went out of my way not too humbly to compliment the court on its obvious preparation. And uh, the uh, joke from uh, Justice Abella was, well, what did you expect? <laughs> and uh, I had a, an offhand remark, well, it's been a long time since I've been here, so you have to excuse me. To which the Chief Justice then said, well, compliments will get you everywhere in this court. <laughs> Our judges are extremely well prepared. If I were to encounter an ill-prepared judge, I would um, expand all this uh, narrowing and reducing of my argument to essential points. I would be very careful to uh, take the time to lead the court to the critical evidence that I had hoped they might have read last night or three weeks ago. Um, with a rude judge, I can't say that that is, has never happened in my experience. Uh, the judge may have thought, or some judges may have thought, that my arguments were inept and that I didn't deserve the time of day that I was occupying in their presence. Or they may have had a, a bad night. Uh, that does happen, but so occasionally are counsel rude. I mean, human nature is human nature. It is uh, very difficult to deal with a judge who has made up his or her mind before you have opened your mouth. And I mentioned in my remarks that it's not uh, uh, rare that judges will dispose of cases really before they hear much of your oral argument. And usually what they'll do, often quite brusquely, is to say to you, you can't possibly win because of this point. How do you get around that? And you haven't answered this. And, and what you need to do is struggle to open a door with that judge. And it's very, very difficult. That's the only element of rudeness that I would qualify under that. But. Uh, David, I wanted to ask you a question because we are talking about advocacy and you talked about how much preparation there is involved in, in getting ready for the oral part of your submissions. And a number of us have often had this situation where you are in front of an appellate court and all of a sudden the questions are being bombarded at you. And you have and you try to answer all the questions that the judge has. How does can you provide us with some tips on how you then get back to those submissions that you'd already prepared in advance and how you find your way back to where you're going to address your main points. If, if, if that, uh, that would be of assistance to a lot of us that have encountered that experience. So a to what uh, the dean has asked. So I'm sure all of you heard Lillian's question. How do you get back on track with your argument once you've been inundated by interruptions from the court. And that happens quite frequently. Um, I didn't always follow the rule of don't duck and defer the question. On occasion, when faced with a litany of questions and an inability to link the last question with the next question, Knowing that I had that point covered in my main argument later, I violated John Sapinka's rule once or twice by saying, with respect, could I defer my answer to that question until I get to page seven of my factum where I uh, intend to deal directly with that? If not, my ladyship, my lordship, uh, I'll be happy to go on with it now. But be respectful, be courteous. The rule against ducking is, uh, comes from the highest of the judges, and I have paid more attention to that in recent years than I used to. Uh, for Lillian's question, um, 
I would struggle to, I mean, there will only be one question at a time, unless we've got a root court. So I would endeavor to answer the question as best I could right at the time it's put to me. And then I'm about to get to my, back to my argument and another question comes at me and I will generally try and answer that question as well. Uh, if it becomes ex too extensive, I may ask the court if it would be all right for me to uh, defer this third question or fifth question uh, until I've had a break or until uh, I've covered over points two and three in my submissions, which I think tie back to what we covered in our first two questions, but aren't, we aren't ready to deal with it. Now this is ducking and twisting. And it's, uh, it's not something I would recommend to uh, uh, a second year lawyer, first appearance in front of the Court of Appeal. I'd be more inclined to do my very best to answer, and to answer, and to answer, and then finally to say, with respect, if there are no other questions, I'd like to get back to, and here's where I was, and here's where I'm tending to go, and maybe try again another little condensed summary of the essence of where you want to go. But I don't know, Lillian, you work with the best. John Laskin, Sheila Block, tell us how you'd answer. <laughs> Having watched some of them, they did it masterfully, but always respectfully, because there is no way that if a judge is determined to get an answer out of you at that moment, that you don't respond, you must respond. But one of the problems, of course, is then finding your way back into the materials. I think what you pointed out, David, is a very important point, which is sometimes because the questions can come flying at you, and they're out of order, that the buildup and the importance of getting to a point by building some surrounding law or taking them to some surrounding facts are important. And that's when I could see counsel say, my lord, I fully intend to answer that question. But before I can get to it, I'd like to take you to this part of the argument because I think it will add to my response and make it more apparent why I say that this this is the argument, uh, this must be the response. So I, I, I take your point, I think you have to make a judgment and you have to be very careful to be always respectful. That's what I see. Much better said than I did. Okay, further, further questions? Not all of your questions will be thrown back at you, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> further questions? Okay, so the next step is to uh, call upon Craig Steele. Craig is a uh, partner with uh, Corskellen LLC. He is uh, uh, a UC Law alumnus, and he is the president of the Calgary Bar Association. Thank you, Professor Lucas. Uh, thank you, David. Yeah, please do <laughs> sit down. Everyone, as uh, Professor Lucas has indicated, I'm here today on behalf of the Calgary Bar Association, the approximately 2,700 members of our organization that practice in Calgary. Uh, I also want to uh, acknowledge uh, the Dean's comments and Professor Lucas's comments about our long-standing relationship with the Faculty of Law uh, that goes back 30 years, as you've heard, and it's been a, a proud uh, partnership for the Calgary Bar Association to partner up with my old law school, a 1989 grad, but back from the bioscience building days. Uh, so I don't know my way around and we didn't have this many students either back then. Um, so on behalf of the Calgary Bar Association, I'd like to present uh, David Tavender with a, a gift in our, on behalf of us and our appreciation for his speech today. I think as all of you have noticed that uh, the practitioners in the room uh, had all the questions because I think they took away so much from you, David, and I thought it was an excellent uh, speech and, and lecture that you delivered today on all of our behalf. Thank you very much. Uh, 
we have for you the traditional Calgary Bar Association token of appreciation, which is our Western silver belt buckle that will look excellent at the Stampede Whoop Up on July the 7th at the outdoor tent. <laughs> And, and a little something that you can consume before then. <laughs> thank you so much, both Calgary Bar and the law school. Thank you so much. It doesn't end there, David. <laughs> I want to call upon uh, JD student uh, Daphne uh, Rzyniak to thank you on behalf of the law school. So just to echo that one, we'd like to thank you for everything you've done this week and for the final day tomorrow. and. Do you guys want to join me? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you again. <laughs> what a wonderful plaque. It doesn't have J.J. Robinette's name on it. <laughs> I want to repeat how impressed I am with this course and with your instructors and with your leadership. I just think it's outstanding. In my day in law school, we didn't have anything remotely like this. And I think as I am hearing through your various uh, panel sessions, all of you are learning tremendously and quickly and very well. Keep up the good work.